This video clip is part of the EPFL introductory course on information computing and communication. Following an introductory clip on computer security, this one is the first clip in a series on that particular subject. In this first clip about information security, we will discuss three topics in sequence. First of all, some basic principles without which there can be no effective security. Secondly, basic risks that threaten information security. And finally, necessary defenses to defeat those threats. Let us start with basic principles. The first principle to always keep in mind is that total security does not exist in the digital world any more than it does exist in the physical world. In both cases, it is always an arms race between attackers and defenders. Where defenders always try to develop stronger weapons to mitigate attacks, whereas attackers always try to develop better weapons to defeat defenses. As a result, the practically achievable degree of security in a real system is always a risk management compromise between the means and the motivations of potential attackers and the means and the stakes of the defenders. The third principle to keep in mind regarding IT security as well as physical world security in general is that attackers will always go after the weakest link in a defense mechanism. The objective of securing computer systems is thus simply that those computer systems not be the weakest link in the overall information protection scheme. But if computer systems are not that weakest link, then what is the weakest link? In practice, it usually is something in the physical world around the IT systems, and in fact, more often than not, it is us the people using and operating IT systems through end-user devices. As a result, again, educating users about IT security is essential, and that is why this series of video clips on IT security is part of EPFL's introductory ICC course. Next, we move to the issue of where threats come from, who or what is behind them. The first source of threats to IT systems is their environment. Environmental threats essentially consist of natural or man-made disasters such as earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, fires, political unrest, etc. Such events tend to be rare but can be very damaging when they occur. A second source of threats to IT systems is individual people. These can be broken down into threats coming from people internal to the attacked organization and people coming from the outside of the attacked organization. Internal human threats can in turn be split into plain errors by programmers, operators, users, etc., and abuses by malicious or disgruntled employees, traitors, etc. External human threats essentially amount to social engineering. Social engineering is what we all experience every day and hopefully detect and ignore. Attempts that leverage our greed, our fear, our gullibility, or our carelessness to convince us to do things that will open a door to a hacker are all part of social engineering. Such threats can come from outside IT systems, for instance being accosted by a stranger on the street, or from inside IT systems themselves, for instance, being contacted via social networks. These threats include attempts to infect our systems with spam, SPIM, which is via instant messaging, the same as spam, or SPIT, the same as spam, but via telephone, as well as attempts to steal our identity via all forms of phishing and farming, including spare phishing, whaling, vishing, etc., etc. Last but not least come technical threats, which are of course also triggered by people, but generally involve much more technical prowess. These in turn can be divided into hacker attacks, which often try to exploit vulnerabilities, that is, accidental security holes found in all software, as we will see later, and malware, 
which is a term that designates malicious software, software that was programmed to do bad things. This is also often the work of hackers, of course, and the result of some other earlier attack that planted the malware in the affected computer. The worst case threat in this space is so-called supply chain infections, whereby a genuine software or hardware manufacturer is unaware of the fact that a malware infection exists in its own internal systems, with the result that all the software or hardware that it sells is already pre-infected before it reaches the customer. After talking about the source of threats, let us now discuss their nature. The very first threat that anyone can easily realize is information threat, theft, be it in the form of political or industrial espionage. The second threat that fewer people realize is unauthorized information alteration. An example of this is depicted in this picture of a bank check. The alteration may not be immediately obvious, but if you look closer, the amount payable on the check has been tampered with in an obviously illegal operation. The third threat we're concerned with is a radical form of information alteration, which would be its total destruction, rendering it inaccessible or unusable. Such destruction may consist of mere erasure of files inside a computer, but it might be as radical as physical destruction of the computer or in fact of a whole data center. Whenever someone commits a crime, one of their first concerns is not to be caught, which often entails not leaving any trace that could lead back to them. This brings up the fourth kind of threat that we're interested in here, which is called repudiation, i.e. the ability of an offender to erase their tracks and deny that they did anything wrong. Unfortunately, a frequent way that IT attackers hide their tracks is by stealing or breaking into someone else's account and operating under their identity to make believe that they are the ones who did something forbidden. This is called identity spoofing or identity theft, and it is the fifth threat that we need to defense against. The sixth and last threat that we're facing is attempts by attackers to completely get around and circumvent defense mechanisms. To be sure, there are also a few more threats to be dealt with, but they are beyond the scope of this introductory course, and so we will not discuss them here. All the kinds of threats we just saw are unfortunately very real and can have dramatic consequences. The financial risk that they represent is measured by the product of their probability or their frequency times the individual cost of any one of their occurrences. So you find on the left of this graph threats of which the cost per event may be minor but the occurrence is so frequent that the resulting risk is not negligible. On the right side of the graph, you find threats that are more rare or unlikely, but of which the cost per event can be considerable. Towards the center of the graph, you find threats of which the cost per event and the frequency of occurrence may be modest, but combined they are still worth defending against. To convince you of the reality of those threats, this slide gives some concrete figures about the cost and commonality of some of them. So for instance, the annual cost of cyber criminality to society at large is estimated at around one trillion dollars, which is a million times a million dollars. All existing software in the world is known to contain well over 80,000 vulnerabilities which are security holes through which hackers can attack our systems. At the same time, the number of malware instances like viruses and Trojan horses is estimated to be between 50 and 100,000 different ones, well over the number of different good software products. Already in 2010, over half a million websites and over 500 million web pages were known to be infected by such malware. Around 50% of all email volume typically is spam. And some 15 million of Facebook's 1 billion user account 
are held by criminals bent on attacking innocent users under false identities. And as incredible as it sounds, every week some 25,000 mobile phones are lost or stolen in London and some 12,000 laptops are forgotten in U.S. airport security checks. While these figures are impressive, they also reflect what society tolerates as part of the noble cost of doing business in today's cyber world. Now that we have discussed threats, let us try to derive what sort of defense mechanism we need to thwart these threats. Remember that we had identified six major threats, information theft, alteration, destruction, repudiation, spoofing, and defense circumvention. The first kind of mechanism of defense that we will need is called confidentiality mechanisms to defend against information theft attempts. This is symbolized in the rest of this lesson by this locked folder icon. A second line of defense that we will need is called integrity mechanisms to ensure that genuine information is preserved and cannot be altered illegally. This is symbolized in the rest of the lesson by this icon of a pyramid that time has hardly managed to alter. The third line of defense that we need is availability mechanisms to ensure that information can survive destruction attempts. This is symbolized in the rest of this lesson by this icon of a vehicle with two spare wheels rather than one for higher reliability and availability. The fourth line of defense that we need is what's called accountability to be able to track at all times who is performing what action in which IT system so as to be able to pin down responsibility on anyone misbehaving. This is symbolized in the rest of the lesson by this icon of a responsibility road sign. A fifth line of defense is called authentication mechanisms to ensure that we always know who is who and to the extent possible defeat identity theft attempts. These are symbolized in the rest of the lesson by this tongue-in-cheek icon of an identity card of Mark Zuckerberg as a CIA agent, which of course he is not. The last and sixth line of defense that we need is authorization mechanisms that cannot be circumvented and allow us to enforce exactly the ultimate objective, which is to control who has the right to process what information in what way. Authorization is symbolized in the rest of this lesson by these icons of a visa or a key, both of which are entry authorization mechanisms in the physical world. 